Uh, this evening with John Bellamy Foster on capitalism and the expropriation of nature. I just wanted to begin by recognizing that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the tsleil tooth peoples. Uh, my name is Am Joha. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and associate with the Institute for the Humanities, who are a partner uh, on this talk with the Vancouver Eco Socialists, SFU Public Square, and uh, my office, SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. And also uh, wanted to remind everyone that the People's Co op Bookstore is also here to sell uh, a number of John's uh, books. And if you're not already, uh, signed up for the monthly review. This is the magazine that John uh, edits, uh, which has a wide uh, reach uh, uh, around the world. Uh, John was doing a seminar uh, this afternoon, which uh, many of you, uh, a number of you uh, were at. Um, uh, uh, and um, on East Van uh, Mazeris, uh, that went on from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock uh, uh, today. And John will be doing a, a number of other uh, public events in the city uh, while he's here. He's based in uh, in Oregon and so close by, but wonderful to have him up here. And when I was working on my own uh, dissertation, I had a chance to read a couple of John's books, which was really uh, helpful in terms of looking at the relationship between Marxism uh, and ecology. Um, John is the editor of Monthly Review and professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. He's written widely on political economy and established a reputation as a major environmental sociologist. He's the author of Marx's Ecology, Materialism and Nature in 2000, The Great Financial Crisis, Causes and Consequences with Fred Magdoff in 2009, The Ecological Rift, Capitalism's War on the Earth with Brett Clark and Richard York in 2010, The Theory of Monopoly Capitalism, an elaboration of Marxian political economy, new edition in 2014, uh, among uh, many others. So please uh, join me in welcoming John Bellamy Foster. We always uh, think of um, British Columbia as part of the, the Northwest. Uh, be, which seems sort of odd uh, because, um, uh, you know, the Northwest refers to the Northwest of, of the United States, but, but um, you know, the, in, in Oregon and in Washington State where I grew up, we feel much closer to British Columbia and what it's represented historically and its relation to the environment than we do to uh, Texas, or uh, <laughs> to tell you the truth, even California. So uh, I'm really glad to be here. My uh, paper is, well, this is month review, just so it's, it's color-coded magazine. If you want to subscribe, you easily can. And um, I'm editor. This is the March issue on the expropriation of nature, which relates to some of the things I'm going to be talking about today. But but this is a, a further development of the argument. Uh, my talk today is called Capitalism and the Expropriation of Nature, Nature the Strategic Discourse of Eco-Socialism. There are too many things on this table. So, the, um, Rob Peck's uh, recent uh, feature film, The Young Karl Marx, uh, commemorating the 200th uh, birthday of, of Marx, opens with a scene of poor pre peasant proletarians, men and women, young and old, gathering dead, fallen wood in the forest, when suddenly they are attacked by mounted police with clubs who chase them down and brutally knock some senseless while rounding up others. The film then switches to a scene of the young Karl Marx, then 22, writing in the Cologne offices of the Rheinische Zeitung, where he was editor, on the subject of the, of, uh, the debates on the law on the theft of wood. Marx wrote five installments of an article on this subject from October 25th to November 3rd, 1842. It was this series of articles, uh, more than any other, uh, that uh, brought the Prussian censors down 
on Marx and, and uh, the newspaper and his talented young editors and writers, and which was ultimately to raise the ire of the, the industrialists who had funded the paper. Um, in the film, we see Marx and his associates debating over the course that had led them to defy both the Prussian state and their own liberal industrial paymasters, placing the enterprise in, in jeopardy over, over the cause of, uh, of uh, the theft of wood. Uh, as he later, as Marx later explained in his famous 1859 preface to the contribution to political economy, it was this attempt to address the expropriation of the customary forest rights of the poor that first drove him to the systematic study of political economy. The closing down of the Rheinische Zeitung early in 1843 propelled Marx and his wife Jenny from Cologne to Paris. So this is how Peck's film starts out. I'm, I'm sure that some of the viewers were very surprised. Um, and yet, uh, this is really where Marx uh, starts uh, his analysis. This is where he enters political economy, struggling over the issue of forest rights, over uh, uh, the theft of, of dead wood. The criminalization of the customary rights of the poor to fallen wood in the forest was a major issue in Germany at the time. In 1836, at least 150,000 of the more than 200,000 total prosecutions in Prussia were for wood pilfering and other uh, forest-related uh, offenses. In the Rhineland, the proportion was even higher. These prosecutions led to imprisonment and fines in Baden in 1842. One in every four inhabitants had been convict convicted of uh, wood stealing. Central to Marx's argument was the application of the cat, was the um, notion that um, uh, the category of, of theft was being applied where it not ought to be applied. Um, the, not only the gathering of dead wood, but the gathering of dead leaves, the picking of berries by children, a customary right, uh, were declared to be theft and uh, subject to imprisonment. Uh, the customary rights of the poor to the free appropriation of dead wood marks insisted were, were not to live or the live organic tree, which could rightly be seen as private property or, or um, cut timber, but applied only to what was already dead in the form of tree limbs and leaves, um, all the way to nuts and berries uh, in the forest. The customary right of the of the poor or forest usufruct in this respect was being turned into a monopoly of the rich through a mere process of expropriation by money grubbing petty tra traders and Teutonic landed interests. And so he's dealing with this question of expropriation. Marx referred to the elemental nature of the forest system and as Peter Lindbaugh argues, rooted his argument in an appeal to the bioecology of the forest and the complex system that it supported, including the rights of the poor to dead wood, as representative of their own impoverished position in relation to nature. Okay, uh, so uh, this is uh, this is um, what uh, causes the Rancho Zeitung to be closed down, because Marx approached this issue so seriously. He decided then that he needed to study uh, political economy more thoroughly. In um, the um, in in the months that follow, uh, he he uh, travels with Jenny to Paris. Uh, in in Peck's young Karl Marx, the the assault of the forest police on the poor is a recurring nightmare in which Marx sees himself as running alongside the peasant proletarians or landless rural workers, giving force to his critique of both expropriation and exploitation under capitalism. So um, Marx is, and here I'm going to get into some of the theoretical issues, why, you know, um, why um, this is so important. Marx's distinction between appropriation and expropriation around which his ecological as well as the economic uh, critique of capitalism revolves can be seen in his response to Pierre Joseph 
Proudhon as dramatically portrayed with, with poet's license in, in the young Karl Marx. Proudhon is presented as making his famous declaration emanating from his book, What is Property? That property is theft. Marx, who is part of the audience, then asks, uh, good humoredly, but what then is property? For Marx, Proudhon's statement logically reduced itself since property is theft, and theft is the removal of property to the proposition that theft is theft, um, and, uh, which Marx says in the film. But then what is property? Marx was not playing word games here, either in historical reality or in Peck's film. Rather, in classical political theory, from John Locke to uh, Hegel to Marx, civil society and the state are both erected on the basis of appropriation the active or verbal term for property, that is the getting of property. That is what pro um, appropriation is. And um, for Marx it goes deeper, appropriation goes deeper than, than simply title to property in the law. Marx explained in The Poverty of Philosophy his critique of Proudhon and in the Grundrisse that all human society rests on the free appropriation of nature, which is the material basis of production which is another way of saying that all society rests on property. There can be no human existence without the appropriation of nature, without property in some form, and without production. To say that property is theft, as Proudhon did, was therefore, for Marx, to skirt the fundamental issue, the development of the various forms of appropriation and property forms in human history, and um, how they occurred along a spectrum that could be seen as varying from the communal to the more extreme forms of private commodification. It's um, precisely because he approached matters in this way, later replicated and advanced in Karl Polanyi's economic anthropology, that Marx was able to develop a powerful critique of capitalist society that was both economic and ecological in character. Proudhon's conception left no way out for human society since appropriation in some form and property in that sense was a universal uh, characteristic of human society. Even if people lacked private property um, as workers, even if workers lacked private property, they could not be denied all relation to the free appropriation from nature and re remain living human beings. Um, we, we, we actually appropriate uh, nature when we when we eat, when we drink, uh, when we breathe, and this is fundamental to Marx's conception. To understand this, why this is important, and this is a, a little uh, uh, theoretical, but I hope um, I, I hope um, it makes sense to you. The, if you look at um, uh, Hegel's philosophy. Hegel um, basically identified alienation with objectification. That was uh, possible in Hegel's idealist philosophy because the, the goal is to bring together the subject and object, and, uh, and um, it's, it's really, for Hegel, a relation within thought. Uh, so um, Hegel, um, Hegel's philosophy and, uh, and his approach to alienation is geared to the unification of thought. Uh, Marx criticized Hegel's philosophy from this standpoint, and uh, he said you couldn't, you couldn't uh, confuse objectification from alienation. Uh, you couldn't confuse the two. This is in the economic and philosophical manuscripts. Human beings are inherently objective beings. That is, we have the, uh, our objects, our needs, outside of ourselves. Uh, we have to draw on, on nature in the, in the sense of natural processes in, in order to uh, live. We're sensuous beings, and we depend on, on our interaction with nature. And this is a material relation. It's not something that can be transcended in the realm of thought. We are inherently posed with objective dilemmas um, as objective beings. But alienation is another, is another issue altogether. Alienation is, um, is a uh, distorted uh, mediation 
between human beings and nature and between human beings um, and other human beings, uh, which is, is, is a product of society and isn't uh, inherent. And um, that is something we can address. We can transcend alienation, even though we can't in, uh, 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 transcend our objective um, existence of human beings. Just in, in the same way, we can't, we can't transcend our need to appropriate from nature. And there's nothing wrong inherently in the free appropriation of nature uh, in terms of, of human existence. Uh, the, the problem comes in, as we'll see, when we have the free appropriation of nature for capital. Uh, which is no, another uh, thing altogether. Nature as a free gift for capital. But we can, we can, um, we have to appropriate nature, but we, we don't have to expropriate um, nature. And uh, what is expropriation for Marx? Marx defines expropriation as, as appropriation without equivalent or without reciprocity. So expropriation is a kind of robbing. It's a kind of, of theft. And, uh, but uh, it means what you're destroying in relation to nature, you're not taking, um, you're not, uh, um, it, there's no quid pro quo. There's no uh, compensation for the sake of, of the reproduction of nature. Um, appropriation without equivalent, whether it relates to uh, other human beings or appropriation without re reciprocity is, um, is what expropriation is for Marx. And this is something that we can address. And actually, capitalism is based on expropriation. So um, when we talk about, and I'll get into this, when we talk about primitive, uh, uh, primitive accumulation, which is not a, a concept of Marx's. He referred to so-called primitive accumulation. He didn't accept the concept of primitive accumulation itself. Marx's, Marx's concept, what he, what he analyzes there is the process of expropriation. The expropriation of land, of nature, and the expro expropriation of human beings that goes along with it that prepares the basis for capitalism that establishes its boundaries. Now, I want to suggest that these same uh, debates are, some of these same issues are being brought up today and are uh, confusing the ecological discussion and the eco-socialism, making it difficult for us to, um, to address uh, these issues st strategically. And I want to uh, point to specifically to, to um, a book by Raj Patel and Jason Moore uh, in their uh, History of the World and Seven Cheap Things. Uh, and in they they argue that the problem is appropriation, and they say they say appropriation is defined as a kind of ongoing theft. So appropriation is theft. That is property is theft. That is the problem. There's no discussing of different forms of property and different uh, association. Um, there's no. Dis it's it's a universalized um, problem in this analysis, and uh, to make it more complicated, and this is in, in J Jason Moore's Capitalism and the Web of Life, but it also is in, in um, A History of the World and Seven Cheap Things, work is defined, they use the concept of work, which is the, the work as, as used in physics. And um, uh, that means um, uh, work is done when a force that is applied to an object moves that object. And they say the problem, the ecological problem, is due to the appropriation of work in the sense of physics. And so um, the, um, they say um, that there's a theft of work, that work is unpaid, um, but the unpaid work is also the work of extra human nature. They say oil fields are unpaid, uh, coal is unpaid, Here's a quote, the work of a tree or river or of an oil, no, um, anyway, the, the work of a tree, of a river, or an oil field, it's, it's all extra human work that's unpaid. 
And the problem then becomes the appropriation of, of nature in that sense. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about the, the implications of this in a minute, but just let me you know, uh, point out I mean, that, that if, if by the appropriation of nature, simply by, by appropriating nature, by eating, drinking, um, breathing, uh, all of the other things that we have to do within our metabolism and our metabolic relation to nature, if, if, that, is, um, um, if that is the problem, then we cannot transcend it. Then, then we, we can only adopt a misanthropic approach where we say the problem is human beings. Um, or if we say that uh, the problem is that our economy um, uh, appropriates um, oil as they do, um, that it's, uh, oil is a case of unpaid work, uh, then what we're, then the analysis is that the problem is that somehow um, oil, which is a, you know, is a, a product of ancient sunshine, uh, is a product of, uh, of millions of years of development, that that isn't paid for, and that the, and, uh, the work in terms of physics that, um, that oil does is not paid for, that unpaid work is the problem. And these are, pro these are issues, if you put it in those terms, uh, you have, there's no possible politics. It plays into the, the logic of the system in certain sorts of ways. Um, but it's very important then to, to keep this uh, separate from expropriation. Expropriation means uh, theft. Um, it means, and there are a lot of different forms of theft, but expropriation is, the, is to take um, from nature or from human beings or uh, without, without equivalent and without reciprocity. And um, that is, um, that's something uh, altogether uh, different. Now, um, it's important to understand just how, how um, significant the concept of appropriation is in, in political theory. If you read like uh, C.B. McPherson's uh, The Political Theory of Possessive Individualism, he has a very uh, uh, detailed discussion in there of, of Locke's uh, political theory of appropriation. And, uh, but it, you, could read, um, you could read Hegel's philosophy of right, which starts with appropriation. And they're very clear that, uh, you know, they try to actually, uh, that, that, cap, that uh, bourgeois society, civil society, and the state are based on appropriation in the sense of property and appropriation in the sense of, of taking from nature. Locke also justifies expropriation, like the expropriation of, of the lands of Native Americans in the sense that they're not, you know, he, he says that they have not applied production, they haven't applied labor to the land and transformed the land. So, so um, they don't have the rights of appropriation and they can be expropriated. But these distinctions are fundamental to the very understanding of bourgeois political economy, to the understanding of, of um, our whole uh, uh, political economic system down to the present day. And I think that what Marx was developing in many ways um, in this respect was, was a, a, a dialectic, dialectic of um, expropriation and exploitation. Because as you probably know, if you've studied Marx's capital at all, or maybe you've gotten this some of it from his other uh, writings, or you might even have figured it out by watching uh, uh, Raoul Peck's uh, new film, that you can't, you can't exploit people in, in production. You can't uh, exploit labor until you, you uh, remove um, the labor from the means of production, which means expropriating the land, which means expropriating nature um, in a very fundamental way. And uh, Marx e argues in the economic and philosophical manuscripts that the workers are, are, are actually forced to live in, in breathe polluted air. 
and, uh, and eat contaminated food and drink contaminated water. So he says that even their, their um, uh, water and their air and their food is to some extent expropriated from them. But this is fundamental to creating the proletarian condition, creating the, the conditions for ex exploitation. And most often we look at this in terms of Marx's discussion of primitive, you know, accumulation and capital. Although if you look closely at that um, section, in capital, it's called so-called primitive accumulation because Marx doesn't accept the term primitive accumulation. He has three major discussions of this other than his early writings, and that's in the Grundrisse. Um, and uh, well, he discusses in his, his early writings, he discusses it, um, especially in the Grundrisse, in his, um, in his, um, dis in his treatment of the dissolution, dissolution of feudalism and the development of capitalism and um, in the so-called primitive accumulation part of capital. And um, it's not, primitive accumulation is for Marx expropriation. Primitive accumulation was the, was the term of Adam Smith, not Marx. And it wasn't primitive because Marx says, he says in, in, the, um, in that section of capital that it continues to occur in his day and he he gives examples, both in Scotland and in India and elsewhere. It continues in the developed capitalism. Uh, and it's also, you know, you could say it's primary. Primitive is actually a mistranslation. The original term was previous or primary in English, and it was trans, then when Ger Marx wrote in German, they translated back into English as, as um, as um, primitive, but it was they 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 translated back a term that was um, originally from English incorrectly. At any rate, it it wasn't simply a matter of the past in Marx's argument, despite what people think, and they haven't looked that closely. But it's also it isn't accumulation, because when you seize people's land, or you can you you seize the commons, which they might not have formal property to. But you are seizing property in Marx's terms. Property is not um, simply bourgeois private property, and um, it isn't determined by that kind of title. Even uh, uh, just as as uh, with indigenous um, peoples, it wasn't. It's still it's still property. Uh, it's still they. Uh, it's the product of appropriation from nature, and. Um, so if you, you seize that and you, you expropriate it and then you turn it into proper, um, private property with a title, you're not accumulating, you're robbing, right? You're, it's theft, it's not, it's not capital accumulation. You have not carried out investments um, and in increased capital in any sort of way. What you've done is expropriated, you've robbed. Now this is especially important to us now, not just because of environmentalism, but because um, neoliberalism in, the, in this particular age of capitalism, the age of dissolution of capitalism, I would argue, we have moved back towards expropriation as, as a, a, a predominant problem. As, um, and uh, there's a dialectic of expropriation and exploitation for Marx to continue exploitation, you have to as you have to somehow change the boundaries of the system. Expropriation is about what happens on the boundaries of the system. The expropriation of land, of nature, of other uh, bodies, the creation of bonded labor, all of that occurs on the boundaries of the system. The expropriation of women's labor in the household, all of this is, is outside of the central core of the valorization process. When capitalism is in a crisis, it tries to change the boundaries, the parameters. It moves towards ex new forms of expropriation. And that's part of the dialectic. Um, it's like the um, uh, Rishichthon in the Greek uh, mythology who required ever more rounds of expropriation of conditions of production just to keep the system going, even to the point of eating up everything ex in existence, extending to himself. Um, and um, expropriation uh, is, is 
fundamental to the logic of capitalism. It isn't a secondary factor for Marx. You can't have exploitation without it. I always think of uh, the film Burn starring Marlon Brando, and there's a place in the, in the film Burn where, where Brando uh, says he he's plays the role of a, of a British uh, agent um, uh, f uh, fighting the revolution, which he had helped start in the beginning. Um, and uh, he, uh, he says, uh, in order to keep on making money, in order to make capital, you have to destroy. And he's talking about the need to burn down the whole island in order to change the parameters, in order to weaken the insurgency. But you have to destroy nature in order to continue to be able to continue to exploit. This is part of the logic of capitalism. Now, now there's problems that have to that arise here that have to do with Marx's value theory, and so I'm going to get a little bit more a little technical again. Although you might think I was already being technical, so. Uh, you may sort of wonder, well, when's he going to get to the point? But, but there are problems of value theory. There's, you know, eco-socialism has really taken off, and for reasons that, that um, have to do with, um, I guess there's two factors. One is, is the uh, global ecological crisis, which is the, the main factor, and the effect that it's having on human beings. But also... Um, there's a, a great, you know, revival of of, of Marxist uh, theory, and this is one of the ways in which uh, people have have come to um, uh, understand M Marx at a deeper level. And eco-socialism is is developing in order to deal with a lot of the contradictions of the the existing ecological uh, movement, the green movement, which is unable to to uh, deal with the complexity of the problem and, um, and uh, lacks a real strategic outlook and certainly lacks a revolutionary outlook. But um, eco-socialism as it grows naturally, like, like uh, every time uh, there's a mushrooming of uh, ideas, there's also um, uh, conflicts that arise. And one of the developments that's occurring is, uh, is a kind of tax, a tax within, with, among um, um, you know, principally academics, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, people who are writing on the left about um, eco-socialism are attacking uh, the notion of, of the labor theory of value. And they say, well, they say nature creates value too, and, and, um, and uh, there's a famous article uh, by uh, the George, George Callas, um, uh, co-authored called uh, Do Bees Produce Value? And Callis' um, view is that they do. Um, and he's looking at it normatively and he's looking at it, at it in terms of physical relations. What he forgets to incorporate into his analysis is social relations. Because value, um, economic value, commodity value is a social relation. And, um, and there are others like Stephen Bunker, Alf Hornberg. Um, um, I, there's an article by Zero Yassin in the Journal of Peasant Studies called The Value Theory of Nature, which says, well, nature produces uh, value. Now, the, and um, they think, well, Marx was, was wrong because he said, and, and uh, he says only labor produces value. Well, the, the, the thing is, people don't understand that Marx was was engaged in a critique of the capitalist system. And what he was saying is that the way capitalist accounting occurs, the way the capitalist value um, system works, capitalist valoration, is that only uh, labor um, generates value, or, or only labor power generates value. And, um, and nature uh, doesn't. Uh, nature provides free gifts. Um, it, it will, you know, it can en enter in indi um, indirectly through rents and so on, but nature doesn't produce value. And if you, um, this is actually the way capitalism works. If you look at, at GDP and you look at, which is how we, we look at value added, GDP, the gross national product, is what we call value added. That's what it is. It's our national value added. 
And if you look at value added, um, if you look at GDP, all value in GDP, or is, at least in the net national product, was the basis of GDP, leaving out depreciation, um, all value is uh, basically boils down to th two things, property income and wage income. Oh, where is the, where's the value that the oil field added? Field added? Where's the value that um, um, you know, uh, the tar sands added? Well, in, in our economics, there is no value added from that. Value added is, is simply in relation to human beings. And in terms of labor, or neoclassical economists would say human services. So um, what, this is sort of a, a way of, um, of emphasizing that this is actually a contradiction for, of the system for Marx. Marx distinguishes between wealth and value. Wealth creates, wealth is a product of nature um, or natural material use values uh, plus human labor. And capitalism leaves, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't however think in terms of wealth, real wealth, which includes natural material use values. It is, its logic is based simply on the exploitation of labor, or simply on the production of, of labor value. And that means that, that uh, natural processes are simply left out of the accounting. Uh, and, um, and that has, um, it's not that they're unpaid, as, as um, Moore and Patel say. It's not that it's unpaid work on the part of um, the ocean or um, a part of the ocean, uh, of, um, of a forest, it's, it's um, you know, we shouldn't treat nature as environmental services to the economy. The, the problem is that nature isn't um, taken into account at all. The capitalist accumulation process follows its own logic and, and it, it uh, crosses, um, it crosses uh, natural boundaries which it, it treats as mere barriers that it can surmount without um, uh, looking at, at um, the consequences. It follows its own logic. So um, the, um, there is, in, in Moore's work, in Jason Moore's work and, and Raj Patel's work, where they start with the appropriation of work, then Moore in, in develops what he calls an expansive value relations analysis where he says, says that um, the, what happens within production, the production of value, the exploitation of labor, is a minor thing relative to the appropriation of work. And that the appropriation of work, remember the definition of work includes any physical movement, really in the universe, any kind of physical movement, motion, um, is work. Anything that, that nature does, which is, is all of um, the physical existence, that all of that's unpaid insofar it's incorporated into the capitalist economy. And he says, well, that's a much bigger thing than the exploitation of labor. And so that outweighs it. And that's our real issue. And, um, but um, uh, that um, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't take us very far to uh, say that, um, let's say, the, the work of a, that a beaver does in building a dam is unpaid work, right? It doesn't help us um, understand, really, um, how we interact um, with nature. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't um, help us if we, we look at um, uh, oil fields as, as or coal fields or tar sands as uh, unpaid work on the part of, of, of nature. But he says this is an expansive of value analysis. So in this exp even though value comes from labor power, we really have to kind of expand it. And there's this kind of extra uh, quasi value that's associated with the appropriation of work. Well, that, that um, and so, but how do you make an analysis out of that? What they do is they come up, Moore comes up with what he calls four cheaps. He says that in Capitalism in the um, Web of Life, he says there are four cheaps. He says uh, the four cheaps are labor, energy, food, and raw materials. And he says what capitalism does is, 
is uh, keep those four things cheap and uh, doesn't really pay for them properly. That, that it's all this unpaid work of uh, not only labor, but, but you know, um, associated with food, energy, and, and natural resources. And labor is put on the same plane, on the same level as food and, and, uh, and energy and natural resources. So, you know, there's no, there's no uh, value theory there. It's all on the same plane. And so our problem is that we're not, we're not um, somehow this is um, unpaid work. And then in the in a history of the world in seven cheap things, they extend it to seven cheaps. And so our problem is that there are seven cheap things. There's nature, um, there's nature, labor, care work, um, lives, um, and then energy, food, and raw materials. I think I got them all. And, uh, and uh, the problem is that they're all unpaid. And then the, there's this notion that extra human nature is somehow, its work is appropriated uh, um, in an, un, you know, like the work of, of uh, women um, in the household, which is, you know, which is um, appropriated in the analysis. Um, and it, it ends up being unpaid work, which it is, in the same sense that um, it's, put, uh, it's put as parallel to the unpaid work of, um, of you know, your, take your pick, anything whatsoever in the natural world. Um, and um, the, the problem then becomes uh, things are no longer cheap, things are expensive, and so the ecological surplus is going down, abundance is going down, and um, capitalism needs to make all these things cheap again. But there's something else going on here, and it's really important because the framework is, is uh, based on a, uh, also in Moore, it's based on what it, he calls a critique of dualism. And, and he has his various framework notions like uh, cap, you know, capitalism, the web of life, the oikos, the world ecology, they all mean basically, they're all ways of not using the word nature. Uh, and uh, because you can't use the word nature because then you would be a dualist because there would be both society and nature. You can talk about society and nature as bundled together, but you can't talk about nature as separate from society in any way. And the consequences of this is this kind of monism or social monism is that our whole problem of the ecological world, and this is, this is people are arguing like this in eco-socialism, is that, um, that our problem is that um, uh, things are, are getting expensive, they're no longer cheap. Um, that seven cheaps are not so cheap anymore and that creates problems for capitalism. It creates economic crises for capitalism and that creates ecological crises for capitalism. But everything is seen through an economic world market model and there is nothing outside of that. Um, and uh, then that becomes a problem because there is no ecological crisis in its own right. Now this is very different than how Marx developed his argument with the metabolic rift. Basically, as you all know, Marx has theories of economic crisis, right? Um, there's there's uh, the falling rate of profit theory, there's profit squeeze theory, realization crisis theory. Um, various forms of overaccumulation. These are crises in the economic logic of capitalism. And um, they're also, but Marx also argues that there, there is such a thing as a metabolic rift, that we, he says we rob the soil of its nutrients and send those nutrients to the cities where they turn into waste and it doesn't return to the soil. And he applies this framework to other uh, areas and he talks about an irreparable rift in the social metabolism between humanity and nature. And what, is he, what he is saying is he's not saying that this is an economic crisis, he's saying this is actually destruction of the material conditions of production it's the destruction of nature as, n not total destruction of nature, but destruction as, of nature as, um, 
as a basis of, of human life uh, and habitation. And this is a different kind of crisis. It's, it, it occurs to a large extent outside of the calculus of the market. And that's why it's such a severe problem that capitalism, if you know, there was a BP, British Petroleum in uh, Australia, gave a, had a, released a report, uh, well, they wrote a report and, and the, the left got hold of it uh, a few weeks ago. And they said, um, if we have an oil spill, no problem, we can profit off of that too. They said there's no downside we, whether the oil is sold or whether there's the oil spill, we will profit both ways. Now, this is a logic that's a totally economic logic, right? And that is very, very dangerous because we actually have to rep recognize that they're natural processes and natural limits. And to try to subsume that within an economic logic, even in a critical analysis, is, is a is a serious, serious problem, right? And um, so um, we have to think about in terms of the expropriation of the earth. But the expropriation of the earth uh, doesn't actually um, occur, you know, it's not, it's not isolated from the social nature, nature of our society. When we talk about the, you know, in, in more sustainable societies, and there have been relatively more sustainable societies, there's no perfectly sustainable society we can point to, but uh, in more sustainable societies, there is reciprocity with respect to nature. There's the, the, uh, the uh, concern with the reproduction of nature. We don't just mine everything, we don't mine the earth. In, in, you know, in the mine the soil, just simply rob. Um, uh, but there's a, a notion of reciprocity, quid pro quo. Um, uh, you know, there's appropriation, but um, appropriation with, with reciprocity. Not, you know, Marx, for Marx, exchange always has to be um, an exchange of equivalence. He never uses exchange in any other sense. And, uh, but you know, if somebody points a gun to your head and you give them money, that's not exchange, that's robbery, in case you didn't know. And the same, you know, in how we relate to the earth. And what Marx argues is, and if you can see it in his dis discussion of so-called primitive accumulation, you can see it throughout his analysis. When he's talking about the expropriation, which is the word he uses to describe that whole process, he's talking about the expropriation of the land, of nature. He's talking about making land into a real estate market, which had never been thought of before. He's, uh, he's talking about expropriation of the conditions of production from human beings, from the mass of human beings, and their monopolization in the hands of a few others, who then are able to gain the free, the free gifts of nature which we should not, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with nature's free gifts. Um, we, you know, that's something we should treasure, but they become free gifts for capital and used according to capital's logic, which have to do with valorization and accumulation and require more expropriation and more expropriation. And, uh, and, but when you're expropriating land and nature, you're also expropriating people, right? And uh, you're expropriating the people that lived on that land who had property. There are other forms of property than private property. And capitalism denies the existence of all other forms of appropriation. So um, you have to look at other people's production, other people's uh, property. You have to look at the development of uh, you know, communal property uh, in various forms. Um, um, the the uh, property of petty producers and so on, and um, you have to understand that uh, their property is being, uh, is being um, expropriated, and then they themselves are being expropriated. And so vicious is this process that in the, in the 17th century, when expropriation was, was, was a really dominant factor under mercantilism in the long 17th century, as we say, um, the, we, were, we were expropriating people's bodies as slaves, as uh, bonded servants, 
as, uh, and, and using people up. Uh, we were committing genocide, which is, is the most extreme form of expropriation of human beings. And this was part and parcel of the expropriation of the land. They came, well, they went together. When, when England, when in, in, in the, when in England, they, um, they were robbing the soil of its nutrients, and uh, they, they um, and it was ending up, it was waste in the cities. They had to get nutrients back into the soil. So they went to the islands off of Peru to get guano um, to l loads of, of bird uh, droppings from, uh, from massive quantities uh, from Peru to, to fertilize the soil in England. They went to the the catacombs of Europe and the battle, the Napoleonic battlefields, and they dug up the bones and they used them to fertilize the, the uh, soil in England. And to get the, they, you know, they didn't dig the guano. To dig the guano, they had to, well, the slave trade had been eliminated from, as far as Britain was concerned. So the British had to set up another slave trade, which they called the coolie trade, which was their term for um, Asian indentured servants. But it was a very specific form of labor exploitation. They brought them to, to, um, to the islands off the coast of Peru. And as Marx said, it was a, it was a form of, um, it was worse than slavery, uh, he said, um, because they brought them in. They were dentured servants. The only thing was they just, they just uh, had to dig guano until they died. And, um, and uh, they died quickly, and then they brought in more. And uh, so this was the, the expropriation of the land has always been related to the expropriation of people. And the system, as Marx said in, in, the, prim, in the section on primitive, so-called primitive accumulation, he says, the system of capital comes dripping into existence um, from head to toe with every, from every pore with blood and dirt. Uh, and um, but but now we're seeing um, these these issues again. Um, capitalism is in crisis. There's economic stagnation. There's very little growth in the core of the system and in the world economy as a whole. And um, and um, it, the, there's an ecological crisis. But the dominant um, approach to these problems is expropriation. And let me. Um, uh, give you um, another uh, concept uh, on this. Um, in the 17th century, um, I'm sorry, in the, in the um, yeah, um, in the in the 18th century, um, ten years in 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 17 around 1766, um, Sir James Stewart wrote his great work on on economics, which was so important for Marx and and Hegel, in fact. And uh, Stuart um, uh, was, you know, remarkable. He, he recognized that value came from labor uh, to some extent. It wasn't fully developed, but he, he, but he also talked about something else. He said, I mean, there was not only profit from exploitation, but he talked about profit upon expropriation. Well, profit upon alienation, which Marx also called profit upon expropriation. What it meant was that in the mercantilist era, and Marx also quoted Benjamin Franklin on this, uh, in the mercantilist era, profits were mainly made by various forms of theft and swindling. That the, the um, basically, you can't, you can't create value by um, in the system as a whole, by buying cheap and selling dear, but you can, you know, certainly it's a way of uh, individual, like merchant capital, can can make um, profits, and uh, and essentially uh, somewhere along the line, somebody has been expropriated. The whole system at that point in the mercantilist era, with the extension of trade, the, the basic way of making profit was through expropriation, whether in commerce or in expropriation of the land. It's only when, when, um, when there's the proletarianization that they're able to create um, really systematically um, 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 
they're able to create the system of exploitation and profit upon production. And, um, but this profit upon expropriation is very important. For example, um, Kostas Lapovitsis in trying to understand the financialization of system is saying, look, it's, it's really a f system of profit upon expropriation. But what we're seeing all around, and this is what neoliberalism is about, is uh, and to a large extent, uh, is, um, is expropriation. We're seeing massive expropriation from the population, from populations everywhere, and um, all kind of financial flows that um, are, are subject to expropriation in one form or another. Financial flows amongst the population, we're seeing this on a global level through the global labor, uh, labor arbitrage, and there's, there's uh, ways of seizing, there are uh, new ways of expropriating people's property. And there's a sense now, this is really, um, a neoliberalism is tied to financialization, but there's these new forms of expropriation, and, and in terms of, uh, of the ecology, there's land grabs in, in Africa where countries are basically expropriating the land of, of, um, of countries, even continents, uh, and uh, for, um, for their own use and not for the use of, of the inhabitants. And this is part of the uh, crisis and dissolution of the system in this period. It's, it's related to the ecological crisis. It makes the ecological crisis worse. If economic growth doesn't occur, if we've got stagnation, they find new ways to expropriate energy and resources to try to speed up growth. Um, and so the there's a shift between expropriation from exploitation as the, as the as as a strategy to expropriation, but expropriation is either the seizure of other people's wealth, and it also creates the parameters for uh, at, at least in the system for for uh, restructuring the system, restructuring accumulation, and hopefully uh, in in the viewpoint of capitalism and those in charge of the system, a new liftoff. But um, that means that we get more rapa rapacious in our relation to the earth. And uh, you may think this is crazy. You may think I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, we can't possibly be uh, doing that. Aren't we very concerned about the environment? But there's, you know, south of this border, there's a, a country with a president named Donald Trump. And if you think they're not speeding up the expropriation of nature as an accumulation strategy in order to get exploitation going within the value process in order to accumulate capital, um, you're crazy you know, if you don't think that's happening. But it's also they, they, um, they want to uh, concentrate more wealth at the top. And one of the best strategies to concentrate wealth on the top is to steal. And the stealing, the theft, the expropriation is occurring on such a, a great scale and in so many ways that, that we can't see it. And there's the, the um, we, we say, we say this is, a, capitalism is a transparent system. They always say they want more transparency. The market is not a transparent system. The whole thing about the market is that it's not transparent at all. You can't see um, the money flows. Um, and uh, you can't see the expropriations. You, you really have to dig to find it out. Um, so we have fundamental contradictions. And I think we have to think in terms of the dialectic of expropriation and exploitation. And um, you know, in the, there's something going on. Because in ecological analysis, we've adopted this concept of expropriation to understand the relation within the system. But also in what we call social reproduction theory, um, I think the most uh, gifted thinkers in this are Nancy Fraser and, and Sylvie Federici. Um, they're also adopting expropriation as the way to explain the relationship between, between the household and, and uh, the capitalist valorization process. Valorization process. So the, the use values that women produce in the household, pr predominantly women, are being expropriated. Um, it's different than the exploitation process um, uh, as, as such, but in some ways it's even more vicious. Um, and um, 
the, um, and in, there's new theories of racial capitalism that are being developed by people like Michael C. Da, uh, Dawson and Sven um, Beckert and uh, Walter Johnson and so on. And they're saying, what is the problem? Well, they say, how do we understand racial capitalism? How do we understand slavery? How do we understand concretely the development of capitalism, particularly in the United States where um, slavery were so central? And they say, through expropriation. So, and there's a movement towards uh, bringing these things together to understanding, as uh, Fraser says, that this is a struggle over the boundaries of the system. And most of the struggles now are occurring on the boundaries of the system because this is where capitalism right now is being most aggressive. And we have to fight those struggles. And eventually, it's got to line up with struggles over exploitation. I say that um, you know, we, um, we, you know, we need to think today in terms of the struggles of an environmental proletariat. And what I mean by that is that the material conditions of people are being compromised in such a way that, uh, and with all of the um, planetary rifts, that um, uh, the, the contradictions that we, the material contradictions that we experience now are almost equally ecological and economic and ecological uh, um, in the sense of what happens to our inver urban environments, what happens to um, um, what's happening to our natural environments and, and what's happening to our food, to our water. And we can't separate that from what we traditionally think of as exploitation within factories and so on. For working people increasingly, and this is more true in the global south than in the global north, that these become one issue now. And I think that if you look back, say, to the English Industrial Revolution, when they were most uh, when the class struggle was strongest, it was because people were fighting for cities and homes and for clean air and clean water as much as they were fighting for wages and working conditions. Look at Engels' uh, condition of the uh, working class in England. That's a work um, that um, talks about an environmental proletariat, not in a proletariat that's just about uh, work in factories. Um, there are a lot of... Um, uh, other aspects to this, but it's important to understand that there is a kind of a convergence in Marxist theory, a very creative space where we're trying to talk about now uh, the boundaries of the system and the strategic struggle over that. Um, and um, in the ecological movement, um, I think ecological Marxism embraces it most um, fully. Uh, but, um, you know, what's the answer? And, uh, well, well, um, I could talk about all sorts of issues of, of organization. I could talk about strategies, but I don't have any time left. So I'm just going to um, quote Marx, and you know, this is also hinted at in, in uh, the young Karl Marx. Uh, Marx said the end of the section on so-called primitive accumulation said the answer was to expropriate the expropriators. Thank you. You mentioned a lot about reciprocity. What would that look like? How would that be enforced? Um, the opening scenes of Young Karl Marx. That time sort of paralleled the rise of scientific forestry, no? Where people were trying to recuperate deforested land and in some sense under, underneath the capitalist logic, trying to recuperate lost, you know, lost forests. It's a perverted recipro like reciprocity, but what would be a more sustainable, ecologically sustainable, and also, yeah. I'll take a few questions. Yeah, okay, I'll go. Uh, one here, and we'll take another one there, and we'll come back to you. Yeah, you, you already answered one of my questions, which I had, which was why Michael Yates was so uh, furious at Jason Moore. But uh, the, the other question that I have is a um, issue that Paul Burkett uh, raises in a couple of places very briefly. 
he talks about um, really looking at uh, labor power as a common pool resource. Uh, so th this ties in very closely with Peter Leinbaugh, he's talking about the commons being a commoning, uh, uh, like a, uh, a collective labor process, uh, and not just uh, a piece of land that is collectively labored. And I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if you have any thoughts on this notion um, that to go back to appropriation rather than expropriation, we really need to think of labor power as a common pool resource rather than an individualizing one. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask very quickly, you use the phrase natural limits when you're talking about the, uh, the, oil, the oil spills and how it's, it's profitable either way. And I was hoping you could comment a little more about what you mean about natural limits as opposed to economic limits or economic crisis. Yeah, the, the, quest, the first question was um, about reciprocity and, um, and um, scientific forestry and um, whether it was possible to recuperate lost forests. You know, Marx has, you know, Marx argued in, in Capital in Volume 2 that um, all the attempts to, to um, restore forests, all the attempts at what we would now call sustainable forestry under capitalism uh, failed, or inherently failed, um, because of the time factor, uh, because uh, we, you know, simply because of the, the time factor that um, we, we um, are not, you know, capitalism a system won't allow for us the time to recover. And, um, you know, it, a lot of it has to do with what you mean by sustainable forestry. This is an area that I worked in, but if you, you know, often in our society it means you know, there's a dominant timber product, let's say, like Douglas fir. And they, you know, it's a question of just um, of um, um, perpetuating the Douglas fir and, and nothing, as far as a forest as an ecosystem is concerned, um, the capitalist market has, has uh, no consideration for that whatsoever. If you want to know how, you know, the rule if you, if, if you're, you're cutting down trees under, under uh, capitalist market principles, is that trees grow at a certain rate. And uh, I mean, this is British Columbia, so British Columbia, so some of you know this, but trees uh, grow at a certain rate. And as they get old, older, they, they grow less rapidly. And um, in fact, this is true for, for animals too, and, uh, but, uh, so, but, but trees will continue to grow for hundreds of years. Um, uh, and um, there's also the interest rate in the in capitalist market. The rule on where the, when you cut down trees is when the growth rate of the trees um, is such that the value increase in the tree, we'll say just one tree, is is um, is um, less than the interest rate, um, then you cut the tree down, and you cut the whole forest down on that basis. It's determined by the growth rate of the tree and the and the rate of interest. That means that we cut down trees that would grow for 200, 300 years, and we cut down cut them down when they're 20 or 30 years old. We cut them down at earlier years all the time. And why is it that, that, um, that the timber industry is so chemical based? Why do we use so many chemicals in timber boots? Because if you cut young trees down, you don't really get the quality of timber. So it has to be turned into a chemical industry. Um, and um, so Marx said you couldn't, you know, the capitalism can't sustain uh, for us. And of course, when you look at it in from an ecosystem standpoint, it's obvious. If you, if you look at, um, at forest lands where I am in Oregon, uh, 
the, you know, um, people say, well, the private uh, corporations would maintain the forests. They say, well, where are the private forests? There are no private forests. The fire forests were all private in the beginning. They're all mowed down. There are no private forests. There's some tree plantations here and there, industrial tree plantations. The only forests are on the public land. Why is that? Um, well, it's because there are some political regulations, not enough, but um, to maintain some degree of sustainability. The capitalist system, the valorization system, is antagonistic to the growth of forests. It's the same thing Marx uh, looked at uh, the uh, mistreatment of animals. Uh, he was looking at how in his day already through, through breeding and various other practices that they were speeding up the growth of animals and they were trying to produce more bones and less, you know, they're basically less bones and more fat and uh, that the animals were being, um, you know, basically destroyed in the process. He said this was horrible. And, and, they, and he said they, they killed them earlier. And what is that? That's because you you know you um, um, you make more profits. Veal is more profitable, right? Um, because um, it's uh, you know it don't have to, it doesn't have to go through the same growth span, and uh, so you know we we should recognize that capitalism, the market, is a different kind of logic. There you know there is it's better to have some kind of sustainable forestry obviously but we should recognize that it's um, sustainable forestry has always depended on on public uh, intervention and uh, the private market has always been uh, disastrous in terms of that in terms of uh, Paul Burkett and the uh, labor power as a common pool resource. Um, the commons is a collective labor process. I wouldn't have probably used the word common pool resource, um, but um, yeah, that's, I think that's correct. I, the, um, one of the things I thought about uh, in my conclusion to this that I didn't mention is, you know, environmental problems have been often um, from, the, from the, um, the dominant ideological model, they've always, often been based, blamed on the tragedy of the commons. And uh, the Gerard, uh, Hardin introduced this and this notion that that um, if you have a commons then everybody will will um, you know try and take as much as they can and the commons will be destroyed. The 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 problem with that is that historically commons have been managed communally managed as collective resources and and involved in collective labor and and uh, and what he's assuming is a commons without any communal management. That is. The, and uh, Brett Clark and uh, Stefano Longo, or I should say Stefano Longo, Rebecca Clausen, and Brett Clark have written a, a wonderful book. It's about the oceans, but it has a wider application called The Tragedy of the Comedy, a Commodity, not <laughs> Tragedy of the Commodity. And, uh, and it, it says, you know, it, it reverses things. It says, you know, it isn't the tragedy of the commons that we have to worry about. It's the tragedy of making things into uh, commodities. Um, that's so dis uh, disastrous in terms of um, uh, management of, uh, you, know, so, you know, what Marx called, um, Marx said, uh, defined socialism as um, the, uh, is the associated producers rationally regulating the metabolism between human beings and nature uh, in such a way as to decrease our use of energy and to maximize our human powers, by which he meant our qualitative development. And he defined socialism in that way. He said that we have to be concerned with the chain of human generations. We have to, we have to maintain uh, the earth, he said, for, for uh, successive human generations. That's the, uh, it, it was the most radical definition of sustainability ever developed. And um, that is crucial uh, for socialism. That's defining of socialism because, so, because the labor process is itself the metabolism between human beings and nature. And we have to understand in order to deal with the labor process, we have to, you know, we have to have substantive e equality, but we also have to have sustainability in terms of, to, to sustainability means um, intergenerational equality. 
Um, in terms of natural limits, um, I use natural limits, and yeah, there are natural limits. Um, uh, unfortunately, my body has natural limits, and uh, in a certain number of years, not too far off, it's going to uh, go kaput. You know, I'm going to. I mean, the the um, the um, natural limits of my body will have been exceeded. But you know, we species die, um, resources are limited. The Earth system, ha the climate has certain limits. We know this now. In in a lot in geography, it's very popular in a lot of um, and on the left to say that there are no natural limits. There's actually no nature. But Marx, at least, was very clear. He says that we have internal eternal natural processes that we have to be concerned with. We, you know, we don't actually produce, there, it's, it's popular to talk about the production of nature, um, particularly in geography, but we don't actually produce nature. We only, as Marx says, we can't produce it. We can only tr change the form. Uh, and that's really important. Um, we, can, we can change uh, the form and, and uh, that's significant. But in terms of actually producing it, nature, we can't produce natural processes. Um, or at least not on, on a big scale, and we can't produce elements. Um, we can't, we can't uh, produce a, a, a new climate because we've, we've destroyed the climate that, uh, you know, that most life depends on. We can't, when we melt the Arctic ice, we can't, we can't reproduce it, right? We can't put it back. Uh, and, um, but we can't even, we can't um, produce, um, we can't even produce uh, human life, right? We can't, you know, we're dependent on the metabolic relations in nature. And the really important thing is when Marx developed his theory of metabolic rift, he was developing the first ecological systems theory. He sort of understood. Uh, he was coming out of, out of the early theories of, of, um, of, um, um, of, um, cellular uh, analysis of metabolism and then the application of this to, to uh, plants and animals. His, his friend Daniels um, introduced him to the science of it and uh, he, started, he introduced the concept of social metabolism and the universal metabolism of nature and uh, he also talked about this rift in the, the metabolism. And this was an ecological systems theory. And all science, of, all ecosystem science, earth system sciences followed the same basic structure of analysis as Marx did. We have to understand that there are ecological systems. And these ecological systems are not created by capitalism, but we can we can disrupt them, we can destroy them insofar as, as um, they are a basis for human life, life and other species and our inhabitation on the earth. So there are limits, um, there are natural limits and we're seeing them. Like when we have, when they say there's gonna be more plastic in the ocean soon than there is life in the ocean. And or if they say, you know, we're, we're actually destroying the plankton in the ocean, we are crossing natural limits, and uh, we can and um, natural and um, those natural processes are dealt with uh, in science. But it um, anyone who you know in the humanities or social science, this is we we've gone past the time where we can pretend that human beings exist independent of the natural world. We can't be human exemptionalists. We can't pretend that we've conquered. Um, the earth and the natural world. We're actually learning that, as, as Engels said, there's, he actually said, it's, uh, it's always, a lot of people are disturbed by this, but he talked, he referred to the revenge of nature. He said, look, um, our, our conquest of nature is an illusion. We find all of these unforeseen consequences. And we actually are faced with bigger catastrophes. Um, the possibility, science tells us, of bigger catastrophes um, than the, um, than um, human beings have ever faced. Um, uh, uh, not, since the, um, not since the ice ages has the extinction of, of, of the species actually come up as an issue. So we have natural limits, we need to deal with them. And we actually have to have an aesthetic approach to nature. We have to kind of, I believe we have to actually 
uh, uh, we have to have a sensuous connection to nature. We have to, uh, we have to recognize our own connection. Um, we have to understand um, that we're not a life apart. And I think that that's part of being a human being too. If we, we remove ourselves too much from that, it's, um, it's crazy. One other point on this, David Harvey says, well, New York City is an ecosystem. And I, I say, well, you know, you could say that from a, a certain standpoint. He says it's an ecosystem like any other because since we are part of nature and we created it, it's an ecosystem. I, I say, well, if you use that logic, then you can say a hydrogen, hydrogen bomb is, is natural. It's just as natural as anything else. And I think you have to recognize that they're alienated mediations, that maybe New York City, I'm not, I'm not down on New York City or anything, but it, it, does, it does expropriate a lot from the rest of the planet. And we have to recognize that and think about it and look at the alienated mediations, see if we can do something about these contradictions. Uh, in my understanding of uh, psychology and philosophy, that's how I approached uh, sustainability in a lot of these issues. In my understanding, or it's been my observation in uh, uh, cross-cultural uh, view of philosophical views of approaching this issue, what we find is that uh, the normative construction in the uh, Western, uh, the Greek or European thought is very much through, uh, through a theory. Uh, their understanding of normative construction, or it's premised on a theory. And in the Eastern philosophy, a lot of times, the normative construction is actually based on self-understanding. Now, why I say that is because, in my observation, I see uh, anthropocentrism as a problem. And that is fueled by when you have a uh, anthropocentric view of self-interest. Because in the Eastern philosophy, they have this ecological view of self-interest, and it goes hand in hand with capitalism, actually. <laughs> so my question is that uh, in the current day and age, what do you think is the role of digital economy uh, and technology, how it's changing the dynamics of physical economy? Because recently, like blockchain project was launched on uh, the expropriation aspect. So for instance, rubber comes from Amazon, but is also used in Malaysia, which was taken away during colonization. But now they're trying to create a system whereby when rubber is sold, the, the Amazonians get the royalties for everything of rubber being sold. I, I, just b b before we get, I couldn't understand the relation to the two parts of your question between the Western and Eastern philosophy and the, and the rubber. Okay. Yeah, my question is uh, more around uh, the concepts of natural capital and ecosystem services, um, some of which have pioneered here at SFU with Nancy Olweiler, uh, and they're finding particular success recently with a tiny town of Gibsons who have actually started to incorporate calculations of natural capital within their assets. Uh, and expanding across cities in Canada, and there's a push to be able to account for those natural features as part of like service delivery at a city level. Um, and so one thing I'm curious about from your perspective is that uh, part of that uh, revolution or expropriating the expropriators, or is that just feeding the economic logic and feeding the beast of capitalism? Um, hi, my name is Gene. I'm uh, with the Vancouver Eco Socialists. And I just wanted to um, shift a little bit in, in the focus here. Like, um, my favorite uh, part of uh, Marxist theory that I learned in a uh, lecture hall, not quite like this, about 50 years ago, had to do with the uh, thesis on Feuerbach point about the fact that uh, all philosophy up until Marx's time had been preoccupied with interpreting reality. And as he said, the point, however, is to change it. Uh, and another thing that goes along with that, I believe, is Michael Leibowitz in the room somewhere writes often about when people are um, involved in doing the work of changing it, 
it not only changes the reality, but it changes them. Uh, so uh, on the basis of those two understandings, I would like to invite everybody in the room to join us on Burnaby Mountain and all of the other sites that we're going to be having battles at over the next little while to shut down Kinder Morgan, uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline, uh, tank farm, and uh, super tanker expansion, which is um, definitely uh, going to be helping to hurry the uh, exhaustion of, uh, and the breaching of all of the planetary limits that um, the professor has talked about. Okay, um, in terms of Western theory and Eastern theory, uh, I, I agree that um, Eastern um, philosophy has, has tended to be um, more ecological in many ways. Um, I mean, if you, uh, if you look at Taoism and, um, and um, yeah, there, 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 there is a more holistic approach to things. And, um, um, and uh, Western philosophy tends to be um, more uh, anthropocentric, uh, mechanistic, and so on. I think that this is true. I think, though, it's also related to, um, I mean, if you went back far, if you went back to the beginnings of, of Western philosophy, uh, you would find uh, more holistic, dialectical, and ecological views. Like, I'm, much of my work is actually inspired by Epicurus and, and Marx's uh, work was too. Uh, the thing is, in Western philosophy, they discarded um, the holistic, dialectical, and, and um, more ecological views. Not that they didn't exist, but that had to do with uh, the triumph of capitalism. And they discarded more materialist views. And they, they, they um, eliminated materialism from philosophy. It exists still in science, or, critic, or realism, and, but in philosophy it has a bad name. And, uh, but it wasn't always that so. And, and so this is partly a product of, of uh, bourgeois society, capitalist development itself. And, um, but I do think there is a difference. And um, I, um, I, I, um, I think that um, uh, we have a lot to learn from Eastern philosophy in this respect. Um, Joseph Needham's. Um, was was um, you know uh, his work on science and civilization in China uh, really um, emphasized some of the ecological aspects of Chinese civilization that made it superior to to um, Western mechanistic science. The um, in terms of natural capital, yeah, I don't I don't like the the concept of natural capital. As far as I know, it it, it first arose in the. Um, in the, the United States in the in the uh, 1830s, but uh, it, but it kind of the co concept came back in the um, uh, more recently in in the in the uh, 1990s, and um, particularly with the work of Paul Hawken and and uh, and and others, and uh, so they they present this notion of natural capital. I think you know one of the reasons. In our society, you know, we have capital, capital, right? That's the, what the, um, the rich go after. And then we have human capital. And uh, we're all supposed to have our own human capital. In fact, we're, we're simply, and that's what we're supposed to be selling and developing now within ourselves is our human capital. Then there's cultural capital and there's natural capital. In my view, um, the, in some ways, we attach the word capital to the end of things to make them important in our society because this is a society that worships capital. Um, but what's the significance of it? The, um, the uh, notion of nat natural capital became big in the United States um, when, when Paul Hawken wrote, wrote his, uh, his uh, piece for um, Mother Jones on natural capital. And Mother Jones asked me to write a reply, so I wrote a reply uh, explaining, you know, why this was actually, um, you know, um, I mean, obviously you want to you want to protect uh, the earth, and but but that this actually fit into a commodity logic 
that, um, that um, really wasn't going to do any good. And I explained why I uh, used in replying to his argument. And Mother Jones decided not to publish my reply. And uh, I asked why, and they said, well, it was, it was too critical of uh, Hawkins' article. And uh, so then, but they'd given me, they, they were, this was the beginning of kind of like web platforms. They'd set up a sort of a thing where everybody could, on the web, where they, were, they could make their comments in this, uh, this uh, uh, little forum they set up. So, and they'd given me the password, and so I put my comments up there. And that got Paul Hawkins really upset. He said I was, I was, um, was it, um, anyway, I was, um, um, I was being too critical of him. I forget what word he used. And uh, I said, well, didn't you say these things in the article? And he said, uh, he said, oh, well, they, they stuck that into the article. The editors stuck it in. I said, well, you, you got it. If you don't believe it, then you have to say. And he says, no, I'm not going to say that. And then he went to write a whole book on the same thing. And, uh, but the, but with the, the thing is that with natural capital, it may be a good strategy in a limited way for a particular community to say, oh, well, these are environmental services we have to protect, like Marilyn Waring argued in, in, um, in New Zealand that, you know, this mountain produced all this wealth and they shouldn't use it for globe, for all these environmental services and they shouldn't use it for gold mining. So it's using the logic of the capitalist market against itself. And, and that can work in a limited way as a strategy. But it's not really what we want to do. We want to actually um, um, question such a system itself. And you know, if you if you put a pr some uh, Paul Hawken argued, if you put price tags on things in nature, then that then then uh, the capitalist market will protect the things will protect uh, nature. And I I said, well, did putting price tags on forests help us preserve forests? Um, uh, the truth is, the way the, the, the capitalist system works, it will destroy things uh, because there's a price tag on it, like a forest. It will also destroy things because there is no um, price tag on it, like beaver dams or butterflies, right? It'll mow over, you know, no, um, you know, it doesn't even exist. Um, um, ecosystems don't exist. So um, the, the problem is the accumulation process and there's no, there's no way that we can save nature by bringing it, internalizing it within the market. Um, it, you know, so the natural capital concept, um, it's, it's might be useful um, when you're trying to you're trying to defend something, um, and we have to use the the existing law and uh, and system sometimes to argue and you know to protect things, but it isn't really the way for us to go in terms of on a, a movement. Um, I don't. You you could say, well, I need to protect my human capital. Somebody has has exposed me to toxic waste, and so they've hurt my human capital, so I need to get a million dollars. And, you know, I wouldn't object if anybody did that. But I don't really think people are human capital. I think they're human beings. Hi, thank you. Um, so if Marx is calling to expropriate the expropriators, meaning to effectively rob the robbers, um, which seems kind of sort of like a Robin Hood approach, and that's something by Robin Hood standards has been happening for about a thousand years now. Um, that doesn't seem to be shaking up the status quo. Um, so if we can't sustain, and if it's too late to rob the robbers given our global eco ecological crisis and facing the sixth mass extinction, um, do you think Marx had a contingency theory or like a backup plan? <laughs> yeah, you know what, Marx was, you know, uh, Marx was one time he was at the ocean and this American reporter came over and, and uh, you know, he was at the beach looking at the ocean and an American reporter came over and asked him, you know, wanted to interview him. And Marx said, fine, you know, and and so the American reporter asked the kind of uh, question that American reporters always ask. Um, 
he said, what is? And Marx uh, looked at, uh, over the issue and he said, he said, struggle. And we don't really have any other answer. The, the, Earth, is, the, the Earth system is being compromised, um, at least in terms of, of uh, present day inhabitants, including the human species. People are being exploited more and more. Imperialism is on the rampage. We're gearing up to new wars and, and uh, new um, um, likelihood of, of nuclear war. And, you know, we can come up with strategies, but there really is, you know, and we have to have, we have to be strategic about it. We have to understand how to organize, but there is no um, answer but to take on the system and to take on it, take it on um, in all, you know, the, its logic all over the globe, join people who are struggling and try to combine our, our struggles and create um, uh, uh, more powerful movements. There really is no um, alternative and it has to uh, develop on on a big uh, scale. I mean, it's sort of, but you know, when, when we're expropriating the expropriators from the standpoint of capital, now, almost anything we do where we put our bodies in the way of capital accumulation, they treat that as expropriation. They, um, you know, in, in, um, recently in the United States, you know, you have, a, you have people who are valve turners who, who uh, turn off the valves to the pipeline, pipelines, right? And um, capital response, and they actually notify the business are going to do this, but they turn off the, then the capital response, you've expropriated, you've taken millions of dollars from us, and, uh, and you have to uh, carry out restitution. And um, because they say they're being expropriated just because you turn the valve off. But anything we do, anything we do to get in the, in the way of capital, is, is uh, seen as expropriation, and we should recognize that it is, and we should, um, we should struggle for that. Uh, we have to be concerned uh, with future generations. Um, so um, if, um, you know, if capital has a low discount rate, then it means that future generations are not worth anything at all. And uh, we have to fight over that. We have to struggle over these things. I don't see any other way, but I do, th I do think that we have a whole heritage in terms of um, organizing movements. What we need most of all is we have all these struggles. Hundreds of millions of people are struggling over the world. What we don't have is unified movements. We don't have connections between our movements. We don't have an understanding that brings us together in, in, um, in, a, in one big uh, struggle, which is really what we want. I don't want to sound like a social monist on that score, but we, we need a movement that, that brings our various struggles together. Uh, David Harvey calls it co-revolution. Uh, I like that term. You know, he's bringing all our different revolutionary movements together respecting them all, building them into one uh, struggle and calling, you know, and, and a co-revolutionary struggle. So, yeah. We've got time for uh, two more questions, but John will be here afterwards oh. so you can approach him uh, directly. Thank you. Um, after about 10 minutes, <laughs> uh, when you started, I, this may be simplistic, but I started thinking about um, what's coming out of the struggle that we're actually involved in in British Columbia with this crazy pipeline, and that is the importance of the indigenous approach to things, which is land-based, and their, the whole concept of being a caretaker of the land as opposed to the capitalist view of being an owner of something. So that's one thing. If you could comment on that, that would be pretty sweet. In other words, we don't have to go to the Far East to uh, see the holistic approach. We could just walk a couple of blocks and <laughs> see some Native people. Um, the other thing is you talk about a movement that collects all the struggles together. And I wonder if you could comment on a Canadian-made movement called the Leap Manifesto, Naomi Klein, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, just actually, I think the last part that you mentioned, that we have to create uh, the connection between all of the revolutionary movement around the world, I think it's very, very important. I'm coming from a place that we had in this decade, the past decades, we had two ways, the revolutionary movement, and it was oppressed, suppressed in a worse and harshest way, possible way. And yet, we haven't heard, we haven't heard any support from the revolutionary movements around the, uh, around the world to support those peoples, uh, support the workers well, in Iran. Oh, I'm in talking Iran. about Iran. The, right now, the exploitation of the workers, it drained them to the worst situation, uh, like for a few decades, past a few decades, worse than slavery. Like w when I was looking at the Spartacus movie, I was just, th I was thinking because the reality and the facts that it uh, exists in Iran uh, for people and uh, the lootings of the um, uh, oppressors and uh, capitalists in Iran, um, the looting of the wealth and uh, dragging the workers uh, to that situation, I felt it was worse, like t triple time, worse than the situation of the um, uh, slavers, uh, slaves uh, at that point. So what was hurting me as a person who was coming from there as an activist for so many years, and I was hoping finally the uprising, this time it would get the right um, uh, support from the activists around the world, I, have, I was totally disappointed. I haven't seen any, any sign of the support, the real support of these workers. And it's important, uh, as it's global, the uh, capitalist system right now is uh, the global village. It's not even like 100 years ago is like whatever happens, the other side at the east that my friend, he mentioned in here, it's affect west right at the same day. So it's important to support each other and having the revolutionary movement around the world. Thank you. All right, well, I mean, the, the first question was, um, you know, talking about you know, basically indigenous people who, who um, of course, are um, leading the way in the struggle on the on the pipeline here and in other places, and and you know the how they view the land as caretakers of the land as opposed to uh, um, owners. I think you know one of the important things about what Marx was was uh, saying about property. Is that I mean, and it goes back again to, to um, the whole you know he was commenting on the development of conceptions of property and in liberal theory you can look especially at at Locke and 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 uh, at Hegel and uh, other thinkers. But uh, one of the uh, Marx argues in the Grundrisse in the very beginning of the Grundrisse that. We can't live without appropriating from nature, and that and any appropriation from nature is a form of property. Um, that's what property is. Um, the the actual legal title to property, um, and the specific way in which property is viewed in our society, is is a specific form, which which we tend to think as the only form of property, and then we're you know. And then we get into a trap. We have to understand that there are other ways of appropriating um, from nature. There are other ways of carrying out production, other ways of having property relations. Indigenous people had property. Locke, you know, for example, argued they didn't, and you could just you could just expropriate it, and which they did. Um, he also he also was. Uh, uh, a slave owner, right? I mean, he, he also owned and 
um, shares in the in the Royal uh, African Slave Company, and uh, and uh, and uh, and wrote the first Constitution uh, establishing slavery in the United States. Uh, but um, and um, but we have to understand that that indigenous people have property, right? And um, that all people have property. There's just different forms of property. We have to understand that. Uh, Marx spent a lot of time exploring that, the different possibilities. We need more communal and more sustainable forms of property. We need other relations to the earth where, where we relate to the earth as, as caretakers, as was said. And um, this is very important. In Marx's capital, in the, in the section, in the, section the part on so-called primitive accumulation, he talks um, about uh, the, the um, he talks about the, the, um, um, the extirpation uh, and um, he talks about the extirpation of indi indigenous peoples, that genocide. He talks about, he, he talks about the enslavement, the extirpation, and the entombment in mines. I didn't know what he meant by entombment in mines until I was asked to speak in Zacatecas once, and they took me down the mines and showed me the bones of the people, of the miners that worked there, the indigenous miners, and were not allowed out once they went in. Anyway, the, um, Marx talks about uh, genocide. He talks about the seizure of the lands of indigenous people. He talks about how that was related to enslavement. He talks about, he gives the, the details on how the uh, colonials in, in the Plymouth colony uh, established scalp, uh, prices uh, for scalps of, of Native Americans. It didn't, indigenous uh, peoples, it, there, were no, there was no scalping before that. It was created as a market um, for uh, the control of populations. And he details how much they paid for the scalp of an adult, um, a you know, man, an adult woman, and a child. He uh, details how much they gave for them um, alive and how much they gave for them dead. In fact, the price was often the same. Uh, he, um, he talks about how the British then paid for uh, uh, scalps um, in, uh, of, the, uh, of the colonials, um, paid the Indians for scalping the colonials uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the war. Um, in the Revolutionary War. But he's, he talks about ens enslavement and seizure of land of indigenous peoples. This is really significant. This is what capitalism is based on. But these people had property in the earth. They had, they had property. They were creative. They, they had a relation to the earth. Our system denied that. It said there's only one form. And even our heads now, when we think of property, we all think of private property in a very specific form. And we haven't understood that, that this is part of, of um, uh, living in a different relation to the earth. We have to have property. We have to re-establish um, re, um, um, what that is. Um, on the um, last uh, question, um, on you know the the latest um, uh, revolutionary upheaval in Iran and and um, you know why you know people are not connecting with that. I think it it is very you know even for the left and um, uh, you know I, I'm an editor of Month Review and and uh, we're struggling with this. I mean one of the there's a, a complicated problem because there's U.S. imperialism and. Um, so um, uh, we spend a lot of time opposing U.S. imperialism, like U.S. imperialism towards the Iranian government. Our position is we don't support that government. That government is oppressive. But we do oppose U.S. imperialism. So we're trying to deal with both. And, and, uh, and so it's a complicated thing. Where do, how do you? Uh, my, um, in this last up, upheaval, uh, one of the people who was arrested was Kavus Sayed Amami, who was one of the leading environmental uh, figures in Iran. He was, um, he, you know, especially 
And in terms of wildlife, he was involved in trying to protect the cheetah. They, they arrested him, claimed that he was uh, a spy. He was actually a, also a Canadian citizen as well as an Iranian citizen. They said he was a spy. They tortured him. And, and uh, they killed him. And uh, he was a very gentle human being. Uh, he was a student of mine. I was on his dissertation committee. And uh, I can tell you he wasn't a spy and that he was a great um, fighter for ecological rights. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, this is a terrible, uh, this is a terrible, a horrible act. And uh, I and others, you know, wrote um, letters on this to, to different places, American Sociological Association, the U.S. government, which is uh, like, like uh, <laughs> you know, spitting into the wind. I mean, we wrote to the Canadian government, which didn't really respond either. We tried to deal with this, this uh, terrible, uh, terrible oppression, and uh, you know he was he was rounded up, and and in response to this uh, latest you know to the latest struggles, and um, and um, you know I don't know what to do, but we we um, try to deal with it. The problem is it's a problem. One of the problems is is it's so caught up now in in this struggle over the Middle East and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Persian Gulf and uh, Central Asia, we have, to, um, we have to fight imperialism and we also have to fight sub-imperialism, the, the oppression within. Sorry, yeah. What? Yeah, at that high. I, I agree with you. I agree with you, and, and it has to be opposed. Kavus wrote a, a dissertation on the, on the Islamic Revolution, on, you know, when I was his chair of his dissertation. I, and and uh, we, we talked about, you know, what, and I mean, I, 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 uh, what was uh, likely to happen, and I, you know, I agree with you. And, but it's, what we have to do is, one of the things we have, we have two problems. We have to deal with the oppression, but we also have to deal with the whole warfare and imperialism and the struggle over oil that's um, untangled, that's caught so many people in, in these uh, terrible, terrible situations. So, yeah. You don't agree. You don't think we need to deal I with it. I think you are talking against Marx right now. I'm talking against Marx? Against well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, I think that people do need to struggle for greater freedom in Iran. I need, they, I need, I think that they, I would like to see that regime overthrown. But I'd, I'd also, um, and, but it's, it's, we have to understand that what happened, um, the whole, Problem. Uh, we also have to put in the whole context of U.S. imperialism and and um, and uh, the Middle East, in which um, I mean, the um, the United States is now gearing for war with Iran, and um, I think I'm concerned about that too. So um, you know, and that's of concern to the Iranian people, and that was of concern to uh, Kavus, my f friend who died. So. I think it's, you know, there are, there are a number of dimensions to it, and um, we have to deal with them all, yeah. And it is very difficult. Um, we, we have to keep it clear. You can't be, you can't be, say, some people will say, well, because, because the Iranian state is in conflict with U.S. imperialism, that you're going to be on the side of the Iranian state. You can't do that. But you have to oppose, you actually have to oppose uh, both, um, uh, you know, you have to oppose both the the regime and and U.S. imperialism in this region, and it is a very difficult problem for us, and we can only do it by making all the connections. 
We could easily be going on for another hour. John will be here signing books, but thank you so much uh, to John.